first. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jivan Palaniandi. Um, I'm a junior studying IR in history and welcome to the South Asian Regional Committee's uh, Resistance in Myanmar panel. So before I introduce the topics of discussion, a little bit more about our IR organization. Um, the Tough South Asian Regional Committee, or SARC, um, is a student-run academic discourse and research group. And our main goal is to promote student engagement with the subcontinent and the social and political and economic history of the subcontinent. Um, over today, we're gonna hope to have an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary panel that covers historical context and the geopolitical realities for Myanmar today. Um, including this is going to be a discussion about civil military relations, the fight for democracy, and context to South Asia as a whole. So let me first introduce our two speakers. Uh, Jock Later is a historian specializing in Southeast Asian studies, focusing on the early, the early modern colonial and contemporary history of Myanmar. Jock Later has published widely in the history of Arakan and Rakhine State and pre-colonial Myanmar. Since 2012, he has participated in interviews and with his scientific pr production to the international debate on Rohingya issues and Rakhine state crises. Mo Tuzar is an ISEAS fellow and a co-coordinator of the IEAS Myanmar Studies Program. She was previously a lead researcher at the ASEAN Studies Center, ISEAS. Um, she joined ISEAS uh, in 2008 after 10 years of leading the ASEAN Secretariat, leading the Human Development Unit. Ms. Thuzer has contributed to several volumes on ASEAN and Myanmar research. As a former diplomat, she is re researching the social and cultural underpinnings of Burma's Cold War foreign policy for a PhD dissertation. Um, starting with Ms. Thuzer, we can begin with opening remarks. Uh, well, good evening from Singapore. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, Jirvan. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to um, share my views uh, from this platform uh, to the audiences um, of uh, the Tufts uh, South Asia Research Center um, interested in the developments in Myanmar. Um, in terms of, well, introductory remarks, I mean, what can I say? Myanmar is facing the bleakest outlook ever, I think, um, in, in its contemporary history for decades. Uh, since February the 1st, 2021, uh, the military coup, uh, the military that sees power in, in a coup uh, has basically catalyzed uh, many crises uh, in the country uh, also uh, compounded by uh, the, the ongoing concerns over COVID-19, uh, the pandemic that still has uh, the world in its grips uh, to a certain extent. And so when we look at um, Myanmar, the situation in the country after the 1st of February 2021, uh, the type of uh, very spontaneous mass resistance to uh, what many people in Myanmar view as yet another imposition of authoritarian military rule. I think, uh, you know, sitting from where I'm sitting, we could say that it's both with precedent and unprecedented. Um, it's both expected and unexpected. And, as, and it has definitely given birth, I think, to many new ways of understanding or interpreting uh, the developments uh, in Myanmar, as well as you know, capturing the imaginations of, of many. So um, I'll just spend the next couple of minutes for, for the introductory remarks by just trying to unpack a bit about what I mean that it has both precedent and is unprecedented. Well, this is not the first military coup for Myanmar. Of course, you know, if we count the constitutional coup in 1958, what happened in 2021 is actually the fourth time that the military has tried to take control of uh, the organs of state power. So it is not without precedent, but what is unprecedented is that, you know, never in the past has there been such this, um, you know, uh, naked display of a power grab, which was the February 2021 coup. And it is also unprecedented in the way that um, uh, people in Myanmar across townships, across uh, ethnic and class lines have risen up in protest, resisting 
uh, the, the, the military rule, the, the junta that is now in, uh, you know, sitting in the seat of power in Nedido, the state administration council regime. So, so this, is, this is what I mean. And ex being expected and unexpected, of course, I think uh, when um, there were noises being made by the military since August 2020 in connection with uh, uh, the, the uh, general elections that were to be held in November 2020 and in the aftermath of those November 2020 general elections in which uh, the, the incumbent National League for Democracy government actually won another resounding, uh, you know, second landslide. Um, the kind of noises and grumblings that we would be hearing from uh, the, 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 the side of the military, I think, led to many analysts uh, uh, expecting uh, something, uh, something big, something bad might happen, but at the same time, trying to apply logic uh, to the situation and uh, hoping that the worst might not happen. But as we have seen on the February the 1st, logic did not apply. Logic certainly did not apply uh, in the case of the, the people who, who staged the coup. And so uh, perhaps that was also the unexpected factor. The other unexpected factor, I think, in the calculations of the military, uh, as well as I think also in the psyche and imaginations of, of communities across Myanmar, is uh, the very strong resistance uh, which the people have demonstrated um, rejecting military rule and the, the uh, volume, the intensity and the sustained uh, uh, impact of uh, that resistance, I think is, is also unexpected and unprecedented. And that is what I meant by now, uh, I think uh, with that, we have uh, now many new ways of uh, trying to understand and interpret the developments in Myanmar, what's happening in Myanmar, as well as um, the, the spring revolution as the resistance movement has uh, named itself, uh, has also seized the imaginations of many inside and uh, outside the country. I'll stop there for introductory remarks. <clears throat> thank you so much for that. And Mr. Leder. Um, thank you as well uh, for the inv invitation for having me. I say good afternoon. Uh, from from Europe, and for me, it's also a pleasure and a really great honor uh, to join you here today. Now, as Jiwan uh, Palyanandi just uh, uh, said, he wanted to have me because I'm a historian. Maybe I would like to say just a word on that. Uh, thanks so much, because I think uh, history is very much uh, disregarded mm. today. Uh, when contemporary issues are talked about, and the Rohingya crisis, for example, is one uh, uh, one example uh, in in particular. Uh, I myself, I used to work on the early modern history uh, because on Rakhine State, on Arakan, because that's a region that uh, there haven't been uh, much research. But uh, after 2012, there was more and more requests to provide some kind of input on the historical background. Uh, of, of the region uh, to understand these problems. And basically over the last 10 years, I've been basically uh, uh, doing that. Um, now, I, I won't repeat what Motuza just said because she put it out uh, very clearly and I, I totally subscribe to what she, she just said. Um, what I would like to uh, underscore, and it's kind of a compliment also to the organizers, because when The Economist uh, just a couple of weeks ago said that Myanmar is about to be forgotten now and that nobody will talk about it anymore. You put Rohingya crisis in the title because that's what actually a, a global audience remember, just talking about Myanmar for nearly 10 years. It was all in, in making the headlines for so many years already. And, and now that's also something that, uh, that's kind of disappeared because uh, it, it's not there anymore because the focus of the media has turned to the uh, to the streets of Yangon and uh, of Mandalay and other places where the the uh, democratic opposition is trying to oppose uh, uh, the coup currently. Um, and um, as for myself, I put in uh, uh, another biographical element. Element. I was in, in Thailand in 2014 when there was a military coup. I remember the coup in Thailand of 2006. I am sufficiently old to have memories of 1988 as well from a distance. I wasn't there. Uh, but then again, each, each of these situations of breakup, of rupture, of protest, of violence, and so is something like 
something really new. I mean, people tend to say that uh, re history is repeating itself, but at the moment we are really at, uh, as, as Motus had just said, it's the bleakest uh, moment ever. And I think it's unpredictable what's going to happen. We, we, we barely can say what's going to be uh, the outcome of the developments now, but what we see is, and I think you got the, that the important point already, uh, that's resistance, that's widespread resistance uh, to what the military have there to do uh, uh, last year. Okay, I think that's uh, 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 basically all that I would like to say uh, as opening remarks uh, to add to what has been the analysis uh, that has been made. Uh, and I think from this basis, uh, we might get into uh, the, the questions. Yep, that was phenomenal. Thank you both. Uh, and now I'd like to hand it over to Arjun to, to begin the moderate discussion. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I think without much ado, let's jump into the moderated section. Um, Professor Lyde, uh, Dr. Lyda, you, you mentioned that um, the, the situation in Myanmar is unpredictable, but at least for now, do you foresee the military uh, maintaining, uh, maintaining control over the central government at least? Um, uh, Ms. Souza, feel free to take this question as well. Uh, well, I think they, uh, if you ask the question, do they have control of power? I mean, they they still very strong. I mean, it's uh, it's it's quite obvious. I mean, the situation, the current moment, uh, as it is, shows that they are still strong. Uh, they've been keeping on power despite the uh, opposition, and they're not ready uh, to compromise. But I, I wonder if that's really the most important issue that we should talk about. Uh, we need to make up our mind if the current moment is a revolutionary moment, or if this is something like uh, a power contest, where in the end there would be some kind of negotiation uh, 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 when one of the parties uh, is too weak to go on uh, fighting. Uh, personally, I, I think that we are in a revolutionary moment, meaning that the resistance is out to uh, fight the army because uh, there's no more trust uh, in the army. Uh, society has lost trust. So it's not just political resistance, actually, it's, it's really uh, the masses uh, um, that are resisting, uh, widely resisting uh, this coup. The majority wants an end to military rule uh, in, in Myanmar. Uh, and, and there, when you're asking question about the means, I mean, we all know that with Aung San Suu Kyi over a very long time, there have been the option of non-violent non means, and now we're in a situation, and that's also something that is totally different, uh, that uh, violent means are, are kind of widely accepted as the only way of proceeding, so, so that people are ready uh, are ready to die, people are ready to fight, you know, to really, because they want to win, they want to put an end to uh, this ex experience, this nightmare that has been going on for, for decades. Right. If I could jump in, I think, I think uh, Professor Leiter has put it so eloquently and elegantly. Um, I, I agree uh, with, with what you have uh, said, Jacques. Um, and I would just like to add to this question, right, because there's no really black and white answer about does the military have a strong hold on power? I mean, it's really a yes and no kind of answer because um, as, as uh, you know, Professor Leiter has highlighted, the military does not have total control, even though they dominate or try to control the organs of state power, the channels of communication and information flows, and of course, uh, most of the, uh, the Myanmar diplomatic missions uh, abroad. So in a sense, they are trying to hold on to that kind of control and, and of course contest that, you know, the legitimacy space, but they also do not have control. If you look at, again, what has, uh, what Professor Leiter has described, you know, on the ground in Myanmar, local administration has completely broken down. And, uh, you know, uh, these, these so-called uh, pacification uh, type of efforts, very heavy handed, violent, violent ways of uh, trying to uh, so-called restore law and order uh, have, have failed because again, uh, we, we see this very strong resistance on the part of the, the people uh, really voicing out that they want to put an end to you know, decades and decades of the, the military having been in this privileged position in the country's political life. So, so they're very, I, I think, um, adamant that uh, 
this this kind of uh, very imbalanced type of political privilege that the military has always taken for itself um, in in uh, in in Myanmar. Uh, must end, and that I think uh, reinforces what Professor Leida has uh, described as, you know, being much more uh, in that revolutionary moment. Uh, of course, uh, I think uh, the international community, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, neighboring countries would uh, want to try and find uh, where there could be mediatable moments, because that is how diplomacy uh, works and functions. And the appetite right now globally also, I think, is tending more towards this kind of dialogue and diplomacy rather than, uh, you know, um, the type of military interventionist uh, responses. And, and that's the, the moment that Myanmar is in now, where initially, I think in the early months following the coup last year, there were calls, there were expectations uh, by the people in Myanmar uh, for, for some kind of you know, responsibility to protect intervention. Um, but right now, uh, you know, what I've been observing all these months, I think really the shift has taken place that uh, the realization is that you know the people are realizing very much that they have to uh, do this uh, themselves, you know, and and uh, really make sure that um, the future for for their children, for their grandchildren, uh, will be one where voice and accountability issues, freedom of expression, uh, can can be there rather than always having to, I think live in silence uh, and, and always uh, in fear of your survival. Um, I've lived through the 1988 uh, military takeover. Um, I lost years of my education due to the disruptions that happened then. So I, I think I can relate to and feel very much what has been going on through the hearts and minds of the young people who really have been at the fore of, um, of the protest because they've had about 10 brief years of being in a situation where they had access to information, they could interact with their peers uh, across borders, across you know uh, any kind of uh, barriers, uh, just by means of the improved uh, access to information and communication flows. They could uh, travel, they could really see you know and and uh, experience for themselves what was going on, and you know from that kind of atmosphere where uh, they could see uh, you know their future full of potential and being able to, I think, uh, you know, find ways and means to realize that potential uh, that that future held. All of that, seeing that all of that suddenly somehow snatched away on the 1st of February, 2021, uh, is something that um, the young people, Generation Z, as we uh, refer to them in, in uh, the Myanmar Spring Revolution context, um, are really, uh, I, I think, the, the voice and the inspiration uh, that have also, of course, you know, um, I, I think brought about many other generations and the whole of the nation to come out uh, in support of uh, what was started as the Spring Revolution Movement, the Civil Disobedience Movement uh, in February 2021 after the coup. Um, you, you spoke about young people spearheading this uh, movement for democracy. Do you foresee a sort of um, a nexus of solidarity between um, the urban or, or the movement for democracy, which is led by urbanites and young people, and um, uh, armed ethnic movements um, fighting for autonomy or even independence? Well, you know, there, there have been communications. And uh, I think a few months into the coup, especially when uh, the, uh, the military forces were trying to uh, really crack down brutally on the protests and, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, nighttime arrests and raids that were taking place in most of the urban and other centers. Um, many of these, uh, you know, the young protesters, well, mostly young protesters, but really it's, uh, it's across all ages and generations. Majority, of course, uh, is, is that generation Z that, um, that I was uh, referring to. Um, they went to uh, the areas uh, under control of the ethnic armed organizations to seek training on, on you know, urban guerrilla tactics and, and to, to really learn, learn I, I guess, to, to resist the military um, in its own game, so to speak, you know, um, they, they sought to really uh, 
learn that armed dimension of, of, of the resistance. So uh, that's what we uh, observed happening in a few months following the coup last year. Um, and, and that's how I think uh, we have also seen uh, many of these local defense chapters uh, also springing up and uh, trying to uh, have some kind of communication. And uh, again, this has historical parallels. In 1988, many of the student protesters, the student leaders also sought refuge and shelter with ethnic armed organizations um, uh, in the, the, the border areas um, flee, when, when they fled for their safety from uh, then the military forces trying to track down. Uh, the difference being, of course, is that um, in 1988, the military's justification for the coup was uh, the nationwide protests uh, that led to what the military defined as a breakdown in law and order, uh, then, uh, you know, so-called justifying uh, why the military intervened in a coup. But really the big difference in 2021 is there were no protests, there were no, there was no breakdown in law and order that actually called for or justified a military takeover. And all the protests that happened, happened after the 1st of February, 2021 in protest against the military coup. I would add that there is a generational dimension here that's extremely important. Uh, and what was that just referred to all these young people that we saw on TV in the streets protesting. Uh, you see, over the last 10 years since Myanmar opened, uh, foreign journalists criticized a lot about the deficiency, uh, about the uh, all the failures, you know, of the democratic process at the opening and legal change, you know, being slow and so on. But now, last year, we saw that uh, all these young people have been going through this, their own revolution uh, in, in terms of opening up to the rest of the world. There was internet, there was material, technical, educational, social change uh, all together. And, uh, and we saw all this, or we see all this now playing out uh, on, on, in this kind of uh, terrific resistance uh, and the readiness to fight for what they risk to lose. So I think that's a very important uh, element. And uh, it's, it's, it's also important indeed to refer to 1988 and the, the backing that the uh, ethnic armed organizations gave the, uh, the democratic resistance at that time. Uh, but we also see if they broadly support today, their still interests uh, may still diverge. So it's, it's leading us to more complexity. Uh, what, what will be the ultimate outcome of this? Obviously fighting the army, Fighting the army uh, uh, in these days is playing in the interest of the ethnic armed organizations as well. So they have an interest to support and uh, there, there, there are difference among these uh, different organizations as well, uh, for sure. But what we see for the moment is that there's a, a, a greater coalition that ever existed opposing the army. It's not just because we see this tremendous enthusiasm of the political resistance, but what we see is it's really building up, you know, it's like ring fencing actually the army in the center of the country at the moment. Right. So uh, it, so I think um, that you, what you're trying to say is that Myanmar is on the precipice of this revolutionary moment. And um, it's interesting to see where we go from here. Um, could you uh, Dr. Lido and Ms. Tuzar speak to the reactions of nearby countries to the coup, um, specifically um, South Asian countries and ASEAN countries. Well, I had jotted uh, down a few notes on, on, on this. Uh, I mean, when you are talking about India in particular, I mean, you're talking not about one India or one Indian voice, there are different Indias when we talk about India. Uh, towards uh, Myanmar, they're the capital to capital relations. And there we have seen what we've seen from other countries of the region, be it Bangladesh, Pakistan, or Sri Lanka, like sitting on the fence and waiting and seeing what's going to happen. Uh, because there has been talk about the military being part and uh, being dominant in the country for always in a way. Uh, so they were like kind of waiting uh, what, is going to, uh, what is going to happen. But then you have a, a different uh, Indian perspective, as I said, like uh, India's interest, look, East policy uh, was 
uh, heavily focusing on Indian interests in the Northeast, as you know. And then you have along the border uh, phenomena similar to what we see on the side of Thailand, refugees crossing the border, but there has been cross-border trade. Uh, there has been uh, local uh, frictions or conflicts or ethnic groups that live on both sides. The Chin Mizoram is one example that people know Naga, another example. Uh, and uh, obviously here India has been pragmatic and uh, maybe local governments must be pragmatic. Uh, and it's a little bit the same when we look at much experienced uh, Thailand uh, facing this uh, current, uh, uh, current situation. Uh, but maybe I would hand over to Motusa and say something on the uh, Thailand-Burma uh, Burma context, because that's something that's a long story in itself. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof. Leiter. Yes, indeed, um, it is a long story in itself, but uh, it's very true. Um, you know, uh, and, and I and I endorse and agree with what uh, what you've said about um, the the different perspectives, I think, within India, from India, when it comes to the Myanmar question. Obviously, Delhi has its own um, strategic and uh, in, uh, economic concerns, but uh, along the border areas, of course, you know, they are dealing more with uh, uh, the humanitarian impact of uh, refugee outflows. I think uh, in the early months uh, after the coup, we did see some members of the uh, police force actually cross the border to India. And uh, that, of course, uh, was something that the, the local uh, government there uh, had to uh, deal with and also um, have, have uh, discussions and interlocute with uh, New Delhi. Um, but yes, uh, pragmatism, I think, is something that most of the countries that share long enough borders with Myanmar uh, would have on the tops of their policymakers' minds. Um, you know, Thailand. Um, it is both a member of ASEAN and uh, also a neighboring country. So, so there are dual concerns, you know, I mean, uh, there are the concerns that Thailand would have as a member of ASEAN with regard to how the, the situation in Myanmar would also uh, impinge on or affect the whole regional uh, security and uh, the regional integration uh, project that's going on in ASEAN. And uh, as, as, as a bilateral uh, neighbor, uh, of course, you know, the refugee outflow eastwards and the rising humanitarian needs along the border coupled with COVID concerns uh, would very much uh, be something that uh, Thai policymakers, the Thai government uh, would be thinking about. Um, let's not forget, I mean, there have always been uh, this, this kind of, uh, I, I think, uh, interest or the, the, you know, traditional uh, mindset, if you will, uh, for, for many of the economic migrants who are seeking uh, better uh, economic opportunities elsewhere, uh, you know, they tend to think of uh, neighboring countries in the region, um, in Southeast Asia, and of course, Thailand, uh, because of its proximity, uh, I, I think is one of those that um, has been uh, one of those, uh, you know, the, the, the prior, the, the, foremost destinations. So there is uh, there is also, I think, uh, that kind of situation going on. Um, and and uh, again, coupled with COVID, as I was mentioning, uh, you know, every country, uh, every economy also wants to look at when they can reopen. Uh, every country has been uh, concerned with uh, domestic um, uh, challenges with, with, with regards to uh, managing and being on top of the COVID-19 pandemic response domestically. So, uh, so I think the, 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 the kind of, uh, you know, the refugee outflow, the people along the Thai Myanmar border as a result of uh, people fleeing conflict uh, in Myanmar, I think these are all going to uh, have an uh, impact on how I think a country like Thailand tries to uh, view and manage the situation. And again, I, I mentioned the, the ASEAN dimension. Uh, at the ASEAN level, of course, uh, the, the interest there is uh, to, to look at um, how can ASEAN uh, help to uh, minimize the spillover effect? Because we've seen uh, with the experience of the response to um, a natural disaster in 2008, Cyclone Nargis, uh, the justification for ASEAN to really uh, intervene in a member state is when regional security, uh, when the situation in a particular member state 
uh, threatens or affects regional security overall. So that's what we're seeing. We've spoken about um, the reactions of neighboring countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia, but do you see a shift in the perception of the international community towards Myanmar after the coup? And um, in addition, do you think that uh, the military's close relations with China have provoked uh, suspicion or even hostility? Maybe Arjun, could I ask you to clarify um, what do you mean by a shift in the, the, the international community's uh, perception? Well, um, of Myanmar, um, yeah, you know, if you uh, could you clarify know. that a bit more. Of course, uh, you and Dr. Lider spoke about how there was this nascent uh, democracy in Myanmar, uh, short-lived though it was. It seemed to, there was genuine hope of progress, but now uh, it's been stopped short by the coup. Do you think that, um, uh, you you mentioned that neighboring countries have uh, interests in mind uh, owing to the, their shared borders and humanitarian issues. What about countries that are more removed from the immediate material effects? Uh, have they been more have they been more hardline on their condemnation of the coup or have they taken a similar stance i would say that the international community um, has a bit of a problem because it tended to be very critical of the government of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi that had been uh, democratically legitimized and uh, on the other hand it was uh, always criticizing and opposed to uh, to the military and now suddenly it's the military again that um, makes a coup and the government that has a legitimacy, legitimacy actually and uh, there were just the elections the year before uh, it's, it's a little bit the international community got a little bit stuck because it was used it got used to this mode of criticizing uh, on a daily basis what the government was doing and now suddenly it would have to switch totally and fully support uh, uh, this this government, NLD, Aung San Suu Kyi, all these people who have been under fire uh, for a number of years, notably notably because of the Rohingya issue. And, and then the interest of the international community was on economic development, where you're talking about China, China was looking for its interest Japanese investments, it was the same. Uh, India uh, has also uh, infrastructure projects that, that it views uh, in the perspective of its own interests and so on and so forth. And uh, within ASEAN, they wanted to have a gentle, uh, uh, well-behaving Myanmar uh, and, and Myanmar was still like a, kind of a dirty kid uh, within the community because it had all these problems that it didn't sort out the way that ASEAN uh, would expect it to do. Uh, now the international community uh, got a little bit stuck because it always been uh, along this uh, principled, either the interests or uh, a very principled stance uh, on on development of, of Myanmar. And now we're in a totally different situation, for, which asks for very clear political expressions of where you stand. And uh, I think that's still not then it's still not really uh really clear on on which will they on, on which way they will go and how they will follow up uh, and that's quite clear in the uh, sometimes weak support that they gave to nug to the uh, exile government uh, that was really waiting for getting more boost much stronger support from the democratic uh, countries uh, that had always been uh, had a lot of wishful thinking about the development of the country and now it's actually a situation where they should be very clear on uh, that they really uh, are ready uh, to also materially support this uh, this resistance that's a point i would make oh i i i completely agree and i think it's really important here also about um you see um when, when we look at the, the criticisms leveled on the National League for Democracy government, it was all in the context of, um, uh, again, you know, the, the Rohingya crisis, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and, and her NLD government seen as, you know, being uh, very accommodating uh, towards the military, um, where I, I think for those of us really studying, following Myanmar, uh, are very much aware of uh, the 
the constraint that the civilian government faced uh, with very uh, type of, uh, I think, unequal, um, uh, the unequal power type of balance there, because, you know, the military, under the military drafted uh, 2008 constitution controlled uh, the appointment of defense minister, home affairs minister, uh, under which immigration also falls under, and um, minister uh, for border affairs. And, and, and of course, uh, the, the Rohingya crisis that uh, erupted with, uh, again, a very, uh, the highest number of uh, people fleeing the country uh, across the border to Bangladesh, uh, that was also uh, something that was catalyzed by the military's disproportionate, um, you know, uh, armed response clearance operations, as they call it, uh, to, uh, to the Rohingya communities in Northern Rakhine. Um, but the, the NLD government uh, sort of bore the brunt of that. And you know, there is still the case now at, at the International Court of Justice. And uh, what uh, Professor Leider has highlighted is uh, very pertinent in that context because um, the national unity government, uh, the government in hiding, the, the parallel government uh, trying to pre pre uh, present that, you know, the loose, broad based uh, representational uh, type of a voice uh, for uh, the people resisting uh, military rule, resisting the, the, the uh, military regime. Um, and, and, you know, act as uh, one of the main interlocutors of the people's aspirations uh, in Myanmar with the international community, I think very early on also had to contend with this. Um, uh, questions about the, the NUG's, I think, uh, commitment to, to a more inclusive and federal type of uh, future. I, I think, uh, you know, it was tied also with how uh, the NUG uh, stood on the question of the treatment of the Rohingya. Um, and I think uh, this, this Rohingya question, this Rohingya topic has also been something that um, the military tried to somehow manipulate or capitalize on very early after the February 1 coup last year. Uh, the military, uh, I, I think, was um, somehow reaching out to Bangladesh to talk about uh, repatriating uh, the Rohingya refugees still in camps in Bangladesh. And of course, here, the, the question is, are, uh, you know, are their conditions uh, conducive enough for safe and voluntary return uh, for the Rohingya? Um, and, and that was a big question mark. In fact, um, ASEAN had put that on its discussion agenda, the Rohingya topic on its discussion agenda since 2016, 2017, and was actually trying to work with the NLD government on facilitating um, the, the repatriation of Rohingya refugees. Uh, when, all, when, when COVID disrupted uh, whatever the discussions and preparations were going on, and of course, you know, further compounded by the coup uh, last year. So, so there is, I think, uh, that, that um, awareness, uh, if, if you will, uh, that uh, the, the State Administration Council regime is uh, also, uh, I guess, you know, uh, looking to how the international community views or would view its actions, and they tried to take up that Rohingya topic. But I think Senior General Min Outline also qualified in an interview, if I'm not mistaken, with Phoenix Television um, uh, last year, too. Um, that uh, again, um, he he did not agree with uh, with the term Rohingya uh, as 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 you know as a community as a population, whereas the NUG uh, has come up with a, a very forward looking uh, inclusive policy that uh, acknowledges the uh, treatment. Uh, the, the very appalling treatment that the Rohingya communities have suffered at the hands of the military uh, for decades, and also undertaking to uh, facilitate citizenship and legalization, basically um, acknowledging that the Rohingya uh, communities who have lived, who have resided in, in Myanmar, uh, need to have that uh, legal visibility. Of course, you know, right now, this is a commitment that the NUG has made. Uh, it, uh, it does not have uh, access to the organs of state power, 
but you know it is a policy groundwork i would like to think that has been laid that uh you know if if future governments uh, elected or otherwise can take it up uh, it would uh, signal uh, quite a big thing Um, I think it's an important issue that uh, you and Dr. Leider raise about the Rohingya, uh, because um, Dr. Leider mentioned that uh, Western criticism of Myanmar has been centered around their treatment of that ethnic minority, and the Western media has been inundated with news of the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya since 2014. Uh, Dr. Leider, could you speak to... Um, other Rohingya in, particularly, in particular have been affected uh, by recent events, uh, such, including the coup and the spring revolution? Well, I think Motu's uh, already mentioned key, uh, key points, uh, and I, I will just pick up again uh, with them. Uh, first of all, as she, as she said, uh, the SAC, uh, the military, uh, jumped on this opportunity of the repatriation issue, and uh, it's quite clear it's, it's like, uh, a device, you know, to get some kind of legitimacy, you know, to reconnect with the international community and say, look, we are still not the bad guys that you think us to be. We really try, try to mend our ways uh, and we keep on working on repatriation, but uh, uh, the conditions, uh, simply speaking, the conditions are not there. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I think uh, with the loss of attention uh, from the international community for Myanmar affairs, there will also be a loss of attention for uh, the Rohingya and uh, the terrible situation in which all these refugees are who are stuck in Bangladesh. Uh, so it's it's like putting more pressure on Bangladesh and Bangladesh will have to move on with the issue uh, without much support also because Bangladesh could also put only put some pressure on this issue towards its neighbor country uh, when the international community uh, was ready. Uh, to uh, prioritize uh, this issue. It, it has been doing so, but uh, there's obviously a risk now that this we are going to uh, to hang on or the, the Rohingyas themselves with their, their hope of uh, that repatriation is going uh, to get underway uh, uh, will be uh, uh, very much disappointed. But then there is something extremely positive uh, uh, that has happened, uh, which is that uh, many people on the streets last year showed solidarity uh, with those who have been victims of the military regime, of the uh, ruthless campaigns of the army and the Rohingya. So people uh, showed their sympathy and empathy for the Rohingyas uh, last year. And there's beyond what NUG, and uh, Motuza just referred it, what, what NUG uh, said, there has been from young people uh, a show of, uh, 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 yeah, I said sympathy, sympathy maybe not, uh, a term strong enough to uh, qualify this, but clearly showing that uh, they were uh, ready uh, to acknowledge that these people had been terribly suffering uh, and uh, just like others. So they, 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 there's been something I think that has been changing in the minds. And then there's something that I like to get back you now when people ask me, uh, ask me to comment on the situation in Myanmar. Uh, which is this generational change, that attitudes are changing and that young people think differently today, differently today from their uh, generation of their parents. Uh, and, and some of those things that they say, well, these are memo attitudes and some of these things uh, are, are really uh, changing. But then I also think that uh, Rohingyas on their side, they will have to adapt also to this uh, new situation. Uh, bear in mind that Rohingyas had been uh, basically building up international alliances to make some progress on domestic issues. Uh, and uh, what they need, what they need is obviously that they get understanding and support from inside the country. Uh, and here I think there will be new opportunities. I mean, we all know that they are talking now to NUG and they, they have been uh, uh, clearly uh, doing advocacy for their cause with those who are now uh, invested in the democratic resistance. So th there are some kind of positive elements, I think, that uh, that come out from the, the current situation as well. But this is all like a matter of patience for the moment and uh, and see forward to, to what's going to happen on the ground in Myanmar itself. I'm curious, given uh, the current situation in Rakhine State uh, the, with the Buddhist... Um... Arakan insurgency, 
the militant insurgency. Um, do you real do you force do you foresee repatriation happening anytime soon, or is it more likely that we'll see another exodus of refugees given the severity of the conflict? Well, f first of all, I, I I need to correct a, a mistake or a misunderstanding. Uh, we should not call them Buddhist arrogant army because they rejected that term Buddhist a number of times. Uh, with their allies in northern Myanmar, they've been clearly stressed that religion was not part of uh, a political identity and they rejected to be called Buddhist rebels or the like. Uh, they have an understanding just like their, their allies, MNDAA, TNLA, Kachin Independence uh, Army uh, and, and also the United uh, War State Army. They all agree on a secular understanding of the state and uh, for them it's Buddhism, but for, for these groups like Kachin, it's Christianity, Catholics or Baptists. Uh, religion should not be uh, a part of this because they're very suspicious of this, uh, of religion being uh, constantly uh, abused. Uh, and they've made that very clear uh, in those territories that Arakan army has been uh, able to control and that's now extending to up to 60% of the mostly rural countryside. Uh, they've been inclusive, they're trying to include uh, uh, Muslims within their vaccination campaign uh, and uh, they've been very clear that they want to have a society uh, where people, uh, where those people who have a right for citizenship will get citizenship. So there are some positive things to be taken out from that but uh, it's true that uh, they, as they didn't make much less headlines than the uh, issues linked to the Rohingya crisis. Uh, so there's still some misunderstanding, I think. So maybe it's helpful to clarify this. All right. Yes, I think I think Professor Leider's clarification is very important because you know, um, the, it was not the Arakan army that drove out the Rohingya. Yeah, let's be clear about that. And I think in pr pronouncements made by the Arakan army's leader, Tuan Rat Nai, um, he is talking about this inclusive, you know, future of Rakhine state, um, which includes the Rohingya. And also, let's not forget, you know, there are there are this uh, this this um, sub ethnic group uh, in Rakhine called the Gamans, who are also predominantly Muslim. So I, I don't think it's uh, it's a question of you know. Um, Buddhist versus the rest, um, and and uh, and as uh, Professor Leider has highlighted, the the Arakan army's uh, a whole overall thinking really is, you know, if you look at their way of Rakita, it's it's protecting their own. In this case, people in Rakhine State, which I think that the the recognition is people who live and reside in Rakhine State, and of course we need to also consider. Uh, that in conjunction with the overall awakening that's been happening across the country, um, I think this realization that you know if if the military forces can inflict such violence upon uh, you know Burman communities, for example, uh, how much have those uh, in the ethnic peripheries? How much of the uh, the the uh, the minority? Uh, groups or communities or the marginalized communities have suffered. I think that was an important awakening that um, the, 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 the kind of the, the brutal repression of uh, peaceful protests after the coup, uh, I, I think, catalyzed. So I think it's important to, to uh, remember those. And um, if, if anyone has used religion as a political uh, kind of means, uh, I, I think it's very clear. It's uh, it's it's been uh, the armed forces, the military that uh, really tried to, uh, I, I think, use that to privilege that. Um, thank you for clearing that up. Um, uh, in the uh, as we are very constrained by time, uh, I'd love to follow up, but um, we do have to move on to the Q and A section. So I'll hand it over to Jeevan here. Thank you for uh, that invigorating discussion. Adding on that, thank you both. That was very informative. Um, first up is Injin's question. Addressed to both, what are your perspectives on the junta's brutal fightings with the People's Defense Forces? Is this leading to perpetual civil war in Myanmar, or is this a brave, selfless form of political resistance? Um, perhaps, Professor Leiter, you could begin. I mean, uh, I, I think there's no more question that we are in a situation of civil war now. 
Um, it's true when you're contacting uh, someone who is in uh, uh, in, in, in Yangon currently, they will say, well, there's some normalcy on the roads and that's the case in other places as well. Uh, but basically, in a, if we take a, a theoretical approach to the current situation, it's quite clear that we're in a situation of, of civil war. Uh, and, uh, and that's a way to look at the current situation, I would say. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question that Indian raised. And uh, yes, you know, it's heartbreaking to, to see the country, you know, spiraling into this state of, um, you know, civil war in that sense. But uh, if we look at what the uh, PDFs are doing, what the young people are trying to do is really to, to, to I, I think, to put an end to this perpetual state of being in conflict. I think we need to look at it that way. Um, you know, we, we, we see and hear of these young people saying, you know, uh, we're going to go back to what we were doing, playing video games, going back to our classrooms, picking up life. But we feel the need to make sure that we have that future where we can pursue our dreams and aspirations um, in, in a peaceful uh, context. Uh, and, and the only way that they see uh, is, is, of course, you know, now participating in that violent action uh, reaction cycle of violence, which uh, the military has has started and is uh, perpetuating by continue by continuing to commit acts of violence, which again have provoked these responses and, and uh, you know, uh, reactions that are violent. Mm -hmm. Building on that, um... Ms. Fuzer, could you describe how social media in particular has been mobilized by young people in the role of group? Mm, when you talk about social media, are you talking about platforms like Facebook, Twitter? I mean, you know, uh, most of the most of the, the the people who use social media, who have access to the internet and information flows, mainly do so through the medium of Facebook. So, I think um, uh, Facebook has been, I think, one of those powerful uh, mediums or platforms. Uh, but you know, uh, there are there are pluses and minuses to that, of course, as as you know, right? Um, uh, very early on, I think the 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 protesters trying to uh, you know to to gather uh, groups together for targeted uh, protests, sit-ins, and so on. Um, uh, the the kind of messaging that they used uh, via Facebook, the kind of information that they shared via Facebook, I think they learned very on also very early on that uh, the the military could also uh, get onto Facebook to try and track. Uh, uh, where they were going to gather, what they were going to do. So I, I think there has been also uh, this this learning curve of uh, you know uh, knowing how not to reveal your location and not to unnecessarily get your 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 fellow um, protesters into any kind of danger, uh, while at the same time trying to mobilize. At the same time, we've also seen. Uh, the the protest, you know, pictures and images, sometimes even short live video clips of the protest uh, being uh, being shown, being shared, and uh, that also I think serves as a, a kind of uh, both inspiration as well as information update on what's going on in other parts of the country, um, and of course uh, many have also uh, you know uh, used uh, these this. Uh, uh, social media to um, to to I think you know promote the kind of messages they want to give. I mean, uh, early on in the coup, there were many uh, who would um, you know bring up the songs, uh, the, the kind of uh, resistance songs that were sang during 1988. But you know we we've, we've seen um, actually 21st century updates. Uh, of, of you know the spring revolution type of songs and movement and everything. So I think um, it, it's that kind of, um, I think power that Facebook has, but um, we also need to see how, I guess the other side, you know, the military or the pro-military supporters 
also tried to use Facebook uh, early on. But now I think most of them have uh, either been blocked uh, on Facebook or Facebook has blocked them and so on. So they've migrated off Facebook. And I think also early on um, uh, after the coup when the military uh, was trying to clamp down on the internet and the information flows um, and block Facebook, uh, many uh, social media users also migrated to Twitter. So I think uh, we, we need to kind of see how that's going on. But uh, one interesting phenomenon that I've observed is that uh, whenever there is some, some discussion going on about Myanmar, or when there is, say, a, a topic uh, or, or something that's discussed that uh, people want to chime in and give their view, we've seen many, many, many social media users, uh, you know, flood those uh, posts with uh, with their comment threats and so on. So I think, um, yes, uh, it's, it's been uh, effective, but it's also, I think, something that we need to look at in terms of uh, not just its um, inspiring informative qualities, but the inherent destructive qualities that uh, also come, come with it, you know. But by and large, I think uh, this is how it is. Of course, um, uh, everybody is aware about um, uh, the 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 information safety of uh, communications on Facebook. So a lot have also migrated to um, more secure messaging apps. Thank you, Ms. Dizza, for that fascinating analysis. Um, Professor Leiter, uh, Rohan asks, do you see a place for Myanmar in great power competition or do you see it lapsing into isolationism, i.e. China versus the US, China versus India? Do you have any comments? Uh, could you? Could you rephrase the question, please? I, I think I didn't get it. Do you see a place for Myanmar in great power competition? Or instead, do you see it lapsing into isolationism? Oh, oh you mean with isolation, you mean that uh, Myanmar would fall back into this kind of condition that it used to have? Um, no, I don't think so, because uh, since it's been member of ASEAN and uh, since it's more economically embedded uh, in the region, since its people have been outgoing and are now present in many countries of the region, in Asia and in the West, uh, all this doesn't predicate this kind of isolation. And uh, it's quite clear that the, the military will try everything by every way uh, to, uh, to keep the machine going on working in their own interests, uh, obviously, but uh, they're really craving uh, to find any any occasion, even the ICC and the ICJ uh, uh, will be uh, uh, one way, you know, of getting some kind of legitimacy, you know, they, they will be happy for anyone talking to them uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, obviously, the, the opposition uh, uh, is keen, um, obviously, to mobilize as much support over over the next uh, over the next years uh, that it will need uh, uh, to move the political situation uh, on. Um, if you allow, I would add a little bit, just a short comment on what Motuza uh, just mentioned. Uh, with regard to uh, to uh, the internet. Uh, people have been criticizing, and rightly so, uh, what's been going on uh, in terms of hate speech in, in Myanmar and the abuse of Facebook and so on. But sometimes I think uh, what has been forgotten is what that this, that this society that has been learning a lot over the last years and also takes its own conclusions from the way it has been uh, discredited and been distributed, in, distributed uh, because of this, uh, the lack in the society of public intellectuals. Uh, if you compare with India, in India, you will, uh, you, no, nobody could say that all the old, all the Hindus are anti-Muslim or something like that. And the reason is that you have public intellectuals, that you have people uh, who take a mic, uh, people who take a pen, people who will speak up in TV shows, uh, and there will be some kind of reaction. And uh, I mean, I don't think, and I think nobody will uh, will claim that uh, there's more Islamophobia in Myanmar than anywhere else. Uh, but simply, uh, the moderate voices sometimes it seems like they don't get out, you know that. And uh, this is something that in other more balanced uh, social situations in other countries uh, uh, we 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 will see it. We consider it as normal that people would say, "Hey, uh, this is extremist. We can't do that," and you know, think about it again. I've been talking with Rakhine people who in 2013 deeply regretted what they said and what they wrote against the Rohingyas. 
you see. But that's never been out in any article of any journalist because journalists had left because they went off with the message of the, of the extremists. And so I think give this country a chance uh, and it will find its way, but it will take a long time. But what we, we see also a number of elements, positive elements, the seeds of a better future. I think that that's what we absolutely need to take down as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Professor Leiter. Um, Ms. Thuzer, if you could comment on the same question, do you see a place for Myanmar in great power competition or do you see a lapsing into isolation? So. Well, you know, uh, Professor Leiter has really highlighted the important nuances of that. I have uh, a small addition um, in the sense that, look, you know, look at what, what uh, happened with regard to Myanmar's credentials at the United Nations. And that's where the US and China actually came to a, a common type of understanding or agreement on, on you know, status quo, on maintaining status quo in keeping the ambassador appointed by the National League for Democracy, continuing in the Myanmar, in, in Myanmar seat at the United Nations. So I think we need to look at it in that kind of commonality of interest rather than, you know, versus or either or or you know each pulling um you know the the, the each basically using the country as as a kind of a, a, a you know a, a tool or a pawn and i think we need to look at it in that context i mean um instability in myanmar does not serve anyone's interest least of all uh, the regional organization to which uh, the country belongs to but neither uh to uh the country's uh which uh, it, Myanmar shares borders with. And, and of course, you know, um, the US being an imported interlocutor, a key dialogue partner of ASEAN, uh, is also uh, interested in uh, the kind of regional stability um, that ASEAN is trying to maintain and, and balance. So I think we need to look at all of that in consideration rather than uh, uh, just, you know, uh, looking at it as a yes, no, either or, uh, position about uh, you know Myanmar's place in great power competition because as I mentioned yes uh, there are areas that they are that that, that uh, obviously there's areas of competition but there are also areas where uh, on uh, I think important uh, geopolitical considerations um, the U.S. and China can and have uh, as illustrated by that UN credentials uh, committee. Uh, decision uh, found commonalities of interest. And I think we have to hope to see where those kinds of constructive commonalities of interest can be found further uh, for the sake of Myanmar the country and Myanmar the people. Thank you so much, Mr. Zer. Um, and up next is our gonna be our final question for today. Um, and I think both of you will have great answers for this. So what can students at Tufts do to stand in solidarity with the young people of Myanmar in PDF, in jails, and those who continue to protest? Um, Professor Leiter, if you'd like to begin. Oh, for this question, I would let Motoza speak first. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll speak from my heart. Don't forget your peers in Myanmar and the challenges that they face. And if you can help tell the story of what your peers in Myanmar are facing and the type of education um, challenges that they are facing. I think with, with that understanding and awareness from, from you know, peer groups all around the world uh, would mean a lot to the young people who've you know, suddenly seen uh, the continuation of uh, their, you know, their educational aspirations, their employment opportunities snatched away. I think that's important. So um, the kind of event that you've done today in an effort not to, uh, you know, let people forget about what's happening in Myanmar, in particular, what's happening to the young people in Myanmar, I think is important. And do think of that. Maybe next time you can try to pull together a panel of these young people from various uh, backgrounds and strengths and skills who can also tell and, and share the story of what they've gone through with this struggle since February last year. I would humbly confirm what Motus has said because there's nothing to add to this. I think many of us whom you're going to ask are teachers as well. We're not just researchers, we're also teaching. 
and uh, what what we need to do is explain and and keep information flowing. As I said, I was shocked when the Economist concluded that uh, Myanmar would be forgot. I mean, if we keep on having events like today, it won't be forgot. Thank you so much. Those are both beautiful comments. Thank you for your time. Uh, we really appreciate having you speak today. Um, on behalf of SARC, well, wish you all the best. Thank you.